Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Even though the crime rate in this country is down and fewer people are jailed, far too many are still incarcerated. Barbara Hansen Treen has devoted much of her life and energy to reforming New York State's correctional system. In her new book, Geranium Justice, she describes in a very personal way New York State's parole system and calls for its reform, and she's my guest today. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. So some people say that uh, incarceration is, uh, might be the greatest social, social injustice we have these days. At least it's one of them. Well, we incarcerate far too many people, and we incarcerate them for much too uh, long a period of time. And remarkably, when I was working in the Division of Parole, and even before that, I would see people reoffending, coming back. And what we would do is confine them for more time each time they committed a new crime. Um, so we have a very high recidivism rate. Well, it's not as high as people perceive it as being. Uh. Um, but the point is that if, in fact, two years doesn't work for somebody, why are we doing more yeah. of what we know doesn't work? I, I don't have the answers, and I always think that um, it's very difficult to criticize unless you have some solutions. So some of what uh, the populace talks about really is highly critical, but until you're in a position to really advance some, some theories that would work better, um, uh, it's unfair. I should say that you were a uh, commissioner of parole in New York State, which meant that you were the part or the leader of a parole board that would go into a facility and hear a person in prison try to tell you his story right. or her story right. and why you should let release them out. the person. Release. Why the, the person is ready right. for a release right. uh, to a safe, to a, to a community that, that won't be harmed. And, um, and that is the role of a parole board. The task of a parole commissioner is to assess risk, not to resentence. And if you can't, um, if you feel that somebody is not prepared to be discharged or released, you have to articulate why you think that's so. If it's based on the crime, which is what usually is uh, transmitted, that based on the nature of the crime, we think you'd be a threat to the community. But the court saw the crime, the court knows the crime. Um, the judge uh, sentenced you to a certain amount of time. So the job is that at the minimum of your uh, period of incarceration, you come before a parole board, you talk about everything you've done, your future plans. There's something called intuition too, and just looking at people and having a discussion. And in my book, I, um, outlined the many ways that it's either changing or hasn't really been followed through. Your book is a combination of everything. It's really a memoir, basically. It is a memoir. Um, but you were appointed a, a member of the board of the parole board. And your job was even harder because sexism reared its ugly head with your colleagues. Correct. So that made it even more difficult. Reading the book, I didn't really see that it was too much on the part of the inmates. I mean, I guess they're frightened or tense anyway to appear before a board, so they can't afford to be that way. Well, anything they would like you more because you'd be like a, more of a motherly figure. Well, uh, uh, you mean in terms of discrimination and treating yeah, or treating treatment, good. attitude? No, no um, I don't think that was ever an element. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I was the youngest person at the time. Um, I came in with a background of social work, and I think that was perceived by colleagues as something dangerous and to avoid, because you might even like people. <laughs> and until you, until this happens to you, the whole prison system and incarceration and the whole criminal justice system, it's, it's, it, it's far away. It's a perception that the media uh, puts out there, and people fear it. Politicians use it as a trigger. They press your buttons, and of course you're going to vote for locking people up and throwing the key away. 
until you get calls in the middle of the night that some politician's relative <laughs> has, been DUI, a, yeah. has been at a raid at a party, yeah. something has happened that was never counted right. on. And then, aha, life changes for people. Well, we've been in a period of lock them up. What, 20 years, 30 years? So the prisons became very crowded. I mean, we have more people incarcerated in this country than any other country in the world. Two Russia. and a half million people are incarcerated in the United right. States of America. So, one of the groups that we're particularly concerned about are the long timers, the older people that were sentenced, what, 15 years to life, 20 years to life, who have been in the prison for so long, who are not a threat to anybody, and they're still there. At how much a person? 30,000, 60,000? Oh, I think it's up. Uh, the last figures I saw were hovering around under 60,000. Yeah. That's it, it's astonishing. Crazy. So now, suddenly, because the prisons were so crowded, people are beginning to see it was costing to politicians, it was costing too much money. So either the courts or the politicians are now trying to, to divert. divert. And it seems to me at the same time, the movement to really reform and get more people out on the merit um, is increasing. Don't you think there's in the air? I, I, I think it's a time where people are really reevaluating um, what works. I visited a program the other night that was just simply fabulous. Uh, one of our old staid, wonderful, not-for-profit agencies in New York, Fortune Society, that helps people. Mm -hmm. And they have a housing. Uh, mm -hmm. situation there. 62 people live in both temporary housing and then they move next door to actual apartments, permanent apartments that are open to everybody. And the, the key to all of this was a sense of community, of knowing one another, of building community, of taking responsibility. And I think that too often we isolate people and um, it doesn't go far in helping connect people with the community once they come home. So do we believe that basic to incarceration is the concept of rehabilitation, remorse, whatever? Or do we believe it's, uh, what do you call it, you know? Uh, we send people away to protect the community. Then there are just desserts, which is kind of the right. male model of punishing people. Um, we... Vindictive, I mean... Uh, vengeance. Yeah, vengeance. Vengeance. There's a lot of vengeance at work, and um, in terms of the parole board, if I could, there, there is a sense, I think, for people who, who are not trained as to what the performance of a parole commissioner should be, uh, there is a sense that they're community avengers that they need to look at the community and, I mean, we always look at the community and what's safe for the community. That's why we're hired, uh, the community first. And the person we're talking to is there because of the crime that's committed, but people mature, people move on. And um, the role of a parole commissioner is not to be a community avenger. The papers fuel that, politicians, as I said, right. do that too. Right. You're, uh, you, but you conclude in your book that not that much has changed since you've not been I a I don't think that that body of is uh, trained. profession they're, aren't, has changed. They're, they're either former correction officers, sheriffs, right? They're political appointments. Right, so they're... It, it, it's a sense it's a of a lot payback. of patronage. It's all patronage. Um, but for a few... Um, but for a few. And for people who, who truly, uh, in terms of their professional background, did understand the mandate. Uh, but many people during my time were there for a few years and they would retire with the last, the highest three years salary. They're finishing out their required time for pensions. Right, as civil servants. Right. And... Um, it's a throwaway too it's, often. It's a throwaway because we see the people inside as people who are uh, disposable. We see their families as people who perhaps don't vote and who aren't important to, to the economy of our system. And indeed they are. 
Um, and they're a big advocacy group. And it would be smart to tap in. And mm -hmm. it's, it's one system, the criminal justice system. And we would do well to bring it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, parole is the back end of the system. Well, it's now been com uh, combined with corrections. Corrections, yeah. right. Do you, uh, is there special training once a person is appointed? I was appointed in 1984, which is uh, a woefully a long time ago. Um, I had no training at all, except to sit in on a board, and then it was explained to me how to submit my expense account. Oh, that naturally. <laughs> I don't know about today's world, so let me not get in trouble with, well, with that. In this book, you talk about all these motels that you had slept in as you made the rounds of all the prisons in the state, the shag carpeting and the orange trim and all the stuff. Am I wrong when I, that I understand now that um, the interviews are There are some video conferencing. How can you justify that? I, I cannot. Uh, they were mumbling about it back in 1996. Um, for me to see a person walk in the room, to make eye contact, I don't know, by the way, the video conferencing, if it's a two-way or if it's only a one-way. If the commissioner sees the inmate, I don't know if the inmate sees the full board. I would, I would certainly at the least hope that occurs. Mm. But um, for me so much, the whole reason for the interview was mm. a personal sense of a human being. Uh, blinking. Um, you talk to people every day that mm. you meet. We all do. And we know from a strut, from a walk, from a cock of the head, from you know, a surliness or a respectfulness, who the person is is and to take that away with video conferencing really m mutes the whole reason to interview in my opinion so it you know there's a lot of attention now to the recidivism and the programs that we need once somebody comes out but the programs in have been cut a lot haven't they i think from with budget cuts and things and we still have the same attitude about people who are in prison, I think. We're now concerned about the recidivism now that crime is down. I don't, I don't even know why, because it's the money, I guess. I, 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 don't, I, just, I think that more people are more aware of poverty and racism. There's no doubt about that. We're more politically correct, do you want to say that? But it doesn't necessarily affect the criminal justice system. And when it comes to the parole board, the long-termers were always a more difficult conundrum because they were guilty as a long-termer of getting a longer sentence, therefore committing a more heinous so they crime. They were convicted. They were convicted. Um, so that is in their background. So 15, 20 years later, you are seeing somebody who served maybe 30 years. And people are thinking, the parole board is thinking, oh, okay let somebody out who served 30 years. I mean, that's just um, reflexive thinking that if somebody served that much time, they're that much more dangerous to release. So when we talk about recidivism, the 23-year-old who has a three to six for a burglary, uh, that person's gonna be much easier to let go because it doesn't look as violent. Um, however, it's not necessarily so. So we've got stacked up Long term, as I brought some numbers with me that were recently published yeah. that were recidivism. Oh, but you um, also have the transcript of a parole hearing, several of them, but the one I thought with the man who was convicted for um, shooting Malcolm X. Yes. Who never said that he was guilty. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, they start with, what's the crime? Why are you here? That's the interview, right? Right and then a right. lecture about how terrible that crime was. Correct. So what's that? Anyway, give me your statistics. I, I just really briefly, be, um, I want to say that in July of this July, um, there were uh, it, six months between January 2014 and July 2014, there was a total release rate of 27%. Now back in my day, which I thought was too low, was the total release rate of 54%. So it's decreased. Now, 
again, uh, you know, I don't want to be inaccurate and quote things um, statistically that, that don't reflect the whole system. Because perhaps with incarcerating fewer and diverting more people at the front end of the system, maybe they're witnessing more violent crimes and so the release rate has gone down. But I don't think so because I'm in touch with the inmates still. I'm in they're, touch they're, with the families. A lot of them are also violations of parole. Um, they wouldn't be blended with, with they these wouldn't be statistics. In their, yes. They would, they well, would they, be. But they create the larger base. Yes, they do. The average age I read someplace is like 37 or 38 years old, which means in this day and age when we've got so many young people in there, there are too many really older people. Yes. Yes, and, and you can't ignore maturation. Um, I always felt that if you have nothing to lose, the people who have nothing to lose live a risky life, um, don't identify with the larger community, um, take what they need. Um, but if you've got something to lose, which is an argument for the programs and for reaching in before people come out and for having increased programs inside to really prepare people for the transition of coming home. Um, it would serve all of us well. I, I mean, I know a, of a couple of people who are serving long time, and none of them should be in prison anymore. None. And it is, I mean, it's almost, it's so stupid, to keep, not only stupid and costly, it doesn't make any sense. You um, want to talk about Oh, the numbers clemency? of... Uh, let's talk a little bit about clemency. That's the other thing that happens. Sometimes when somebody's sentenced to a very long sentence, right? Or for what reasons do we have clemency appeals? Clemency is for extraordinary... It, it, it's an extraordinary measure to correct an injustice. It's built into the system. It's, it's, legis it's, a, it's, it's legislative. legislative there. It's a en wonderful, enormous power the governors and presidents have. Exactly. And it shouldn't be used as forgiveness. It's not forgiveness. It's for extraordinary measures. Um, I know a woman at this point who's serving a sentence of a 75-year minimum. Well, that's Judy Clark, right? Yes, yeah. Judy Clark. And much has been said about the nonsense of her being incarcerated for 75 years. As a minimum, that's a life sentence. And this for a person who was penalized at the time of sentencing because she refused to participate in her own trial. Uh, so this was a penalty for not going along with the justice system. Uh, her co-defendants have been home in the community doing great work, living ordinary lives, or or extraordinary lives, as it turns right, out. Right. And she is there for no reason. It, 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 there's a reason. It's a political reason. People are afraid because one of the victims, especially because some of the victims were, was it one police officer and the others were Brinks guard? I think there were two, two police two, officers. Two police so, officers. But um, it's, it, 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 people People commit their crimes. It's so difficult to talk about because it, it, it really makes no sense. And to logically put it together, I'd need to write it down and, and, yeah. and read it. And there are men who committed a crime when they're 17 years old, 18 years old, who have spent 25 years in prison and who've gone and gotten graduate degrees and who have started programs inside, who mentor people. What are they doing in their they're 50s? Sick. What? They're lame, they're yeah. adults. And then they're, they're even older, right. And, and they should be granted, their sentence should be corrected. If you've served more than half your term, you automatically go before parole. Is that right? Parole or clemency? Parole. It, you serve the, the minimum I see. of an indeterminate. Yes. So if it's three oh, to six years, I see. at three years, you are eligible to be discharged. I see. But if you've served half of your long term, you, you can apply for clemency. Correct. Correct. And yes. it's an awesome power that some people have used. I mean, they, the figure here, Reagan has five, did 500 and some odd clemencies it, it, in it, California. 
Carrie did 155. Uh, Jerry Brown now just did 127 in one year. And um, Andrew Cuomo didn't do any. Correct. Um, Patterson did three. It, it, it really it doesn't should not make any be sense. seen as a political uh, button. It should be seen as part of the system that was built in to correct an injustice within the system. It's overdue from the governor because he's been very outspoken about our culture, about incarcerating too many people. And then he's closed prisons. He, he was overridden in his desire to increase education programs. He's interested in uh, programs to deter going to prison and, I guess, coming out. And he's got this awesome power to also let some of these older people, especially, who've served so long time to get out. It's just, uh, I, hope he, I hope he changes his mind. Right, because he's done some wonderful yeah. uh, things in the system, and this is just part but of it. It's a funny part of the system that it's allowed to be the whim of somebody. So, it, I mean, when we talk about reforming the system, we should have different reforms. <laughs> it should be considered an automatic review of long term or something like that. And yeah. hasn't there been some um, conversation about having a panel, uh, a committee look at, at clemencies? I mean, certainly there's a whole clemency uh, office a, right. in Albany, of course, right. and they come to the governor's attention through rigorous... And I uh, think there's some kind of informal group, but it's all employees. I mean, it's... Yes, yeah. I mean, they're there right. to look at that. But I'm talking about a yeah, panel... panel of outside uh, experts or people. Yes, yes. Including a social worker. <laughs> now, you, in this book, I mean, you've got a lot of personal stuff, but you've got some outstanding transcripts. And since the, the book was published, um, You've got a whole thing about one of your first uh, Mark responsibility. David. Yeah, Mark Chapman. Yes. Uh, one yes. of your first responsibilities when you worked for the Corrections Board in New York was to interview Mark Chapman when he was first arrested, right? Correct. Yes. And now he was denied yes. clemency again. Yes, yes. The, the eighth time. Yeah. The eighth time. Well, y you know, that is about the importance of uh, the killed. victim. Right. Um, that is about never is, paying his dues for an international icon. That, that in my belief, will he, he will not be released. But the other part of that is mental illness. And we're looking at a system that if you're not crazy when you go in, there's a good likelihood you'll be crazy when you come out. There are so many parts of this system. There's solitary confinement. We've heard and we've seen right. all, all about solitary confinement. And we know people have um, kind of tested themselves on how they would fare being locked up for a day, 12 hours in uh, darkness. Um, it, it, it's inhumane, it's cruel treatment. And it ensures that people will be more dangerous if they ever come out. So. We need to look at the larger picture, which is to stop the violence and humanize people and do everything in our power, which would cost less than what we do now, to um, humanize people and make them ready. And the influence it has on their children. I mean, a lot of people who are in prison are parents. Um, we, didn't, we haven't talked about women in prison. It's a whole different story, right? Um, but it is, um, it's just an astonishing thing. So the, the, may, the governor has pardoned a few people. Isn't that what he's done? People who have already served their time or who have already out of the system. Is that a pardon? Um, do you mean they're off parole, they're not on parole supervision in the community? Because a pardon is really forgiving the crime, oh, totally. And that's, that would be federal. I think, and you, you mean a, a, a governor can't do that? It's not really maybe. called a oh. pardon. What it is would it? be called what, what? clemency, where somebody could be... See, pardon, I think maybe he's give, let three people who are already out clean their oh, record. Oh, so then they've, they, he's forgiven, wiped, expunged yeah. the record. Right. The record okay. has been expunged. Right. Yeah. So and that's that would because be a that and the importance of that though is also the um, the way the community accepts you once you've been labeled 
an ex-prisoner. <laughs> Correct. Which is something yeah. that we need as a society to understand better. Yeah. Well, we have in New York the Legal Action Center, which you know is a, is a, is a wonderful agency to go to. I don't know how often they succeed in terms of, of the laws with not holding crimes against uh, people. But I've always counseled people to be absolutely honest. When one is going for a job, when they say they have a felony in their background, um, there are all kinds of ways that you won't be hired, all kinds of things held against you. And also, you can't go back to public housing. Right. And your whole family is, out. is evicted. Right. So it, it, it's not just the individual. It, it's the it has tentacles. Yeah. Yeah, it's the whole can, thing. Can uh, felons vote in the state? If you get your certificate of relief uh. granted to you, and I don't know the, the uh, mechanics of that uh, today. So if somebody wants to buy this book, read this book, where do they find Amazon it? Amazon.com, uh, Geranium Justice, The Other Side of the Table, It'll give you a glimpse, more than a glimpse. It'll give you um, up close and personal introduction to being inside, to many of the reasons that one finds themselves inside, particularly women, which we didn't get a chance to talk right. about. So you need to do that show at some time. And you'll see how uh, Barbara Treen and I have been friends for a long time that we haven't told you before, right? Right, <laughs> right. Anyway, we've come to the end of our program and you, next time you're here, we'll have to continue our discussion. Thank, Thank you, you so much. very much, Barbara Treen. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.